Good evening. Oh, there we go. Thank you all so much for coming. We're happy to have you. My name is Janine Takach. I'm the president of the Women's Network here at SEI, and along with 17 other representatives um, from all of our business units and competencies, we're bringing you a whole suite of fall events um, kicked off by the Jen Groover event tonight, as we call it internally. Um, Jen Groover is our guest speaker tonight. We're very excited to have her. She is a business expert and a successful entrepreneur and creator of the Butler Bag, um, which is a compartmentalized handbag, as well as Leader Girls, a program to foster leadership in girls. And these are just two of um, the many entrepreneurial um, events that she's worked on. She's also a lifestyle expert and content creator for major networks like NBC, MSNBC, CBS, Fox, and more. And tonight she's going to share with us um, how to really tap into and identify your passions and strengths um, to lead with purpose and conviction, which is why we're having her here today. The Women's Network is here to foster success in our employees, um, especially in finding your strength and passions to make sure that we can bring them to work. So really excited to welcome Jen Gruber here tonight, so please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. I know that you ha don't have to be here, so I'd like to acknowledge the fact that anytime anyone is in a room, even when it's mandatory, um, that they could be in a million other places, either physically or mentally. So um, I'd like to acknowledge that you're investing in your own personal growth. The most su successful people in the world invest in themselves and work on themselves first. So I'd like to applaud you all for being here and investing in yourself. And also in return, I acknowledge that I want to give you a thousand percent of everything I can possibly give you so that when you walk out of here, you think to yourself, that was the best investment of my time. And I'm grateful that I was there and nowhere else. So um, I want to really acknowledge and applaud your investment in your time, not just today, but going forward, don't leave this space today and let this be one of the only things that you do from now until the end of this year. Um, I always challenge people to commit to a, a once a week of different activities that are going to make them grow emotionally, physically, intellectually, so that you can constantly be on a trajectory. Even though you're in a corporation, I am told that this is very much of a lot of entrepreneurial thinking and thriving. So you are your own brand. And the more you can brand yourself and stand out, the more productive you're going to be, the more successful you're going to be, and the more fulfilled you're going to be, which is the most important thing. Um, one of the biggest topics um, to align with, with passion is really happiness. And happiness is what every single person in this world wants. It is the common ground and the commonality between every single person in every single country, with every, no matter what your background is. And so we're really going to talk, at the underlying tone of tonight is how are you happy? How do you become happy? Because once you're happy, you can achieve all of your goals, all of your relationships thrive, whether they're personal or professional, all of the, your leadership thrives because people want to be around you. And when you're happy, you're more mentally clear and you're more productive. And therefore, your output of what you're doing is at a greater magnitude. So that's the underlying tone of everything we're going to talk about tonight. How does it bring us back to happiness? I always joke that I became an entrepreneur when I was in first grade, when Sister Elizabeth tied me to my chair with yellow yarn. That's a true story. Sister Elizabeth did not get the fact that networking was going to be my biggest asset in my personal and professional development. She didn't realize I was going to be a skill set that I needed to become an entrepreneur and thrive in the entrepreneurial world. But networking is such a powerful thing. And I bring that up right now in the very beginning because human interaction is the greatest capital that we can have for with ourselves. It's the greatest opportunity for us to grow with every single person that you come in contact with and you network with. You have an opportunity to learn and grow. Those relationships come to you so that you can learn about yourself, see a reflection of who you are. And so human capital is your greatest asset that you have for every elevation that you have in your life. So if you're working on a passion, like I had said, something investing in your personal growth, that growth is going to come, come more when you're doing it with other people, when you're surrounding yourself by other people in order to learn and grow. But as an entrepreneur, my real journey began when I was in college. I went home for holidays, 
and I went to the gym and I did this thing called step aerobics, which definitely dates me, yes, I know. And I went to the gym and I did step aerobics and it was really new and exciting at that time. And I did this class and it, that hour went by so fast. And I thought to myself, this is amazing. I'm working out and I don't even feel like I'm working out. I feel like I'm dancing the whole time. This is awesome. So I went back to my university, which was Kutztown University. So in this, yeah, great, some KU people here. <laughs> um, so I went to Kutztown and I said to the directors, uh, we need to get about 100 steps. I need a boom box, literally a boom box. And I need a gymnasium <laughs> so that I can host these classes, so that we can motivate people and forget that whole freshman 15 philosophy and we can get everybody in shape. Because I was an athlete all through all through high school and in college I was only playing soccer. So for someone who had played three and four sports their whole life, I felt very sedentary and I felt like I was going out all the time and I felt like I wasn't eating as healthy. So I wanted to motivate people. So they said okay, they bought me these hundred steps, they paid me to run this athletic program, this teamwork that I pulled together with other people who were passionate about fitness. And next thing you know, I had a hundred people in a room the first night with a boom box what I forgot to ask for was a microphone. <laughs> so I am in an old gymnasium with the craziest, loudest acoustic, the worst acoustics, I should say, in the world, screaming, and I got the greatest high ever. I had chills all over my body as I looked around the room and I saw 100 people motivated, moving, even when they were doing the grapevine in the wrong direction and bumping into each other. I found such great excitement and energy from that moment. And I thought to myself, this is awesome. This is such a great feeling. I'm looking at all these people so motivated and so excited. And so I did that throughout the rest of college. And then when I graduated college, I had a degree in education and psychology. My dad is extremely old school. And he believes that whatever you get a degree in, you should do for the rest of your life. That was not my idea at all. I was getting my education and psychology degree because I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I figured that degree would be beneficial for everything that I could possibly do. And so when I graduated, to appease him, like many people do, I went to teach kindergarten for a year, and I confirmed that that was what I did not want to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> and God bless the people that had the patience to do that, which was not me. But God later gave me twins to teach me the thing that I needed to learn the most. So I went to my father after that time period and I said, I can't do this. I don't, I don't like it. I'm driving to school every day feeling sick to my stomach. I, I, I want to like get a car accident so I can be late and have a good excuse. I'm like wishing ill will on myself. This can't be normal. This can't be how life is supposed to be lived. I don't want to live the rest of my life like this. So I said, I want to go into the fitness industry. Now, the fitness industry, this is 1995, 96. The fitness industry was not at all what it is today. And so my dad said, how on earth are you going to make money doing that? And I said, I have no idea. But I know that I'm passionate about it, and I'll figure it out. Because when you're passionate about something, you can create amazing things around it. And so I found this path that kind of just, I kept following my passion and all the things and tools and people that I needed kept popping up. I started a gym in Wilmington, Delaware. I partnered with a guy who had a personal training business and he wanted a group fitness business. And that was my favorite thing, group fitness. And my last name being Groover, I called it the Groove Shop. And so next thing you know, I'm in business with this aerobic studio and personal training business as the Groove Shop. From that moment, I became a national level fitness competitor. I worked with Reebok on the aerobics performance team, and I started corporate fitness programs at companies like NBNA, AstraZeneca, DuPont, and all of the other large corporations in the area when group fitness programs were not being done. I had no idea what I was doing. No idea. But what I did know is that I was passionate about what I was doing. And what I did know is that I had an intention. And my intention was to inspire and empower people. And when your intention is greater than yourself, all things are possible. When your intention is authentically bigger than you, people show up to help you along the way. So on this journey, I started to lose sight of why I really got on this path. 
I became caught up into the fitness industry. As I was doing my competitions, I started to define myself by my body fat content, by the size of my clothes. And I got ill at 26 years of age from overtraining and overworking. I had massive oxidative stress, which started to attack all of my organs, including my kidneys, liver, heart, thyroid, and adrenal glands. You could imagine how it feels to have those major organs start to not function at a high level. The beauty of it is at 26 years of age, I learned the value and the essence and the number one priority of health. Because if you do not have your health, you have nothing. Nothing. I couldn't remember a lot of things at that time period. I started to feel depressed. I wasn't depressed, but because of my illness, I started to feel depressed because my organs weren't functioning properly. I felt like I couldn't get motivated no matter what I did. I didn't even drink coffee back then. I started drinking coffee to at least get a jolt of energy. I couldn't find passion anymore because my health was compromised. I find that moment to be one of the greatest gifts because I believe when you are on the right path, all the right people and things show up for you. When you get on the wrong path, you'll get a lot of signs. And eventually, universe takes its course and steps in your way so you can not go any further. Now, I recognize that as a sign that I shouldn't go any further down that path. Most people ignore all of those signs and continue to go down a path that they're not supposed to be on. And they think that their will should override everything that they were meant to be doing versus what their purpose and what they're here for really is. I luckily listened to all of these signs after I couldn't actually fight them much more. And I reevaluated my life, something that most people don't do until their 40s and 50s. I had to do at 26. I had a second act already coming at 26, which I never planned for. I thought I'd be doing that until at least that I was 40. Seems so far off. I'm 40 now. <laughs> Back then, it seemed like an eternity. But at that time period, I didn't have a plan B. I had 20 employees. I had a thriving business. I had to pay everybody else before I paid myself. But it was the greatest gift in the world because it caused me to evaluate why I am who I am, why I do what I do. Not what I do for a living, but why I exist. Most people ask me all the time, what business should I start? Well, they'll say to me, I want to start a business and I don't know what I want to do, or I want to switch careers, but I don't know where to begin. And I look to them and I say, you're asking the wrong question and that is why you're not getting the answer. You're asking, what do you want to do? It's who do you want to be? Who do you want to be in this world? What is your legacy going to be? When you leave this world, what are people going to say about you? They're not going to talk about the hours that you clocked in. They're not going to talk about the money that's in your bank or the car that's in your driveway. They're going to talk about the impact that you made on their lives. That is a legacy. I learned about a legacy this year, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it later, but my, or, I'm sorry, six years ago when my mom passed away. It hit me so hard when you lose somebody so close to you how quickly life changes, how short life really is. And so a legacy to me is the number one question where you start. That's how you begin to tap into your passion. That's how you begin to value every single day that you have, to give everything that you have, to not waste time on things like drama, on things that are needless and wasted, to actually participate actively in every single day to be the best version of yourself that you can be, to show up ready to learn, ready to grow, and most importantly, ready to give to other people, to inspire and empower other people. Because it is in service that you become alive. It is in serving other people. Remember I said to you my intention in that fitness business was to empower and inspire other people. Once I got caught up with me and it became about me is when I became ill. Because all I was doing was putting in negative thoughts toward myself I was evaluating myself in a very linear, one-dimensional, selfish way, and I was not giving in the same way that I had set out the intention to. And so when you live in a place of all about me, 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 then you begin to wither and not give the passion or the gifts that you were given here. I, I always say to people, if you want to figure out who you are instantly, 
One action step, you want me to give you the one action step that you need to do? Go give service to somebody else. Go give service. Volunteer somewhere. In that moment, if you volunteer somewhere where people are less fortunate than you, you will quickly learn who you are and what you're capable of and how valuable your life is. Not for yourself, but to other people who have less than you have. I did a PBS special this year called Empowered. And Empowered is something that's a word that's used over and over again. I was reached out to by PBS to do this special called Empowered because they wanted to, me to share my unique, as they called it, vision about what empowerment really is. When people think of empowered, they think of someone who's really strong and intense, someone who's a powerful leader in a very masculine energy way. Or they think that it's power over somebody else, someone who can lead, but also have power over other people. My definition of empowerment is to have enough power within so that you can lift up others who can't yet lift up themselves. That is truly what empowerment is. And so I learned that at a very young age, but I didn't know how to articulate it or define it back then. And I continued on my path as an entrepreneur. And all of these amazing things continued to show up and arrive for me that as long as I stayed on my path. And so what I want to share with you today is how do you get to a place of being empowered? How do you become a leader that just radiates positive energy that attracts people to you like a magnet so that you can be the most productive person that you can be, so that you can share your gifts with other people and make an impact that leaves a legacy greater than your status or your title, so that your legacy has an impact in a way that people are talking about it for decades to come? How many of you want that? I think all of us do, and it doesn't have to be on the magnitude of, of what people think you know, Hillary Clinton's doing right now. It could be sim something as simple in your community, something as simple in a nonprofit organization that you volunteer, something as simple as being a mentor within this organization. That's a powerful thing. That one person's life that you touch and you don't know where they go and who they're going to become is powerful. So the process begins by asking, as I said, what is your legacy? What do you want people to say about you? What do you want people to remember about you? And the next step in that is to evaluate the trigger moments in your life. Now this is the hard part for people. This is an emotional part for people. The trigger moments in your life are usually not good moments. They're usually strong, adverse moments. They're moments that you don't want to remember there are moments that most of us don't want to talk about and we shove under the rug. Those moments are actually the moments that make you most powerful when you embrace them and not allow them to make you a victim. Those are the exact moments that unlock the key to your purpose and why you're here. If you actually allow yourself to see what they are, evaluate what they are, and be truthful in how they affect you. I'll give you an example of mine so you can understand the theory or philosophy behind this. When I was younger, when I was in seventh grade, my father cheated on my mother. I caught him cheating on her, which is a big thing for a young girl to observe. I had to tell my mother because I couldn't live with knowing this. My mother, when I told her, she said to me, I know. I've known for a long time. But what I will go through in leaving is going to be a lot worse than what I will go through in staying. Now, what I witnessed up until that day was nothing wonderful or blissful or anything happy. So I thought to her, it can't be worse. It can't be worse. Just go, be free, fall in love again, be happy. And she said, it's not that easy. She said, but what I do know is to have you as a daughter, I need to set an example for you so that you don't allow things like this to happen to you, to be in a position like this. So she confronted my father, and when we left for the weekend, he left, we came home, he was gone, all of his stuff was gone, and he left $400 on the table. I watched my mom, who by the way, was one of the most powerful, strong women that I have ever met in my entire life, who was not afraid of anything in my mind except for my father. This woman who was so powerful and strong, she 
spoke in front of tens of thousands of people. She ran campaigns for politicians and created one of the first televisions for Cablevision to put them on the hot seat when they weren't living up to what their commitments were. The same woman, when she would come home, would be diminished. Her light would be diminished. Her strength would be diminished in every turn possible. And when he left that day, when he came home and she saw that $400 on the table, she collapsed completely into a chair and was hysterical. From that, day mo that, from that day forward, my mom, emotionally, physically, and mentally, was completely drained and not there. She fought so hard to financially provide for my brother and I, but it was really challenging when she was going through so much of her own turmoil and stress. At that time, I committed that I would never, ever, ever allow someone to control my happiness or my finances. At that moment, I made a contract that I didn't even realize that I made. I witnessed something that could have made me a victim and angry and resentful the rest of my life, or I could use it to make me powerful. I chose to become powerful. I watched my mom struggle. A year and a half later, she had a massive stroke, the first of seven strokes. She lived in a wheelchair for the rest of her life after that fat first massive stroke because she also had an aneurysm that bled into her brain. The powerful emotion that comes from that story is I was set on a path of independence. Independence not just financially, but independence to have control of my own emotions, control of my own destiny, and most importantly, control of my own perspective to be positive and in a way that was powerful. And so it wasn't until I was 35 years old that I had to speak at an event that I actually figured this formula out, that I actually realized how these trigger moments truly define us. I was asked to speak at an event for women who, it was called Defining Moments, who were giving grants. These women came from extremely challenging backgrounds, very challenging, beyond things that I could even conceive. And I was asked to give a speech about my defining moment. And as I really reflected before I gave this speech, what that was, I was going through all these moments. And what I didn't realize is they were all so superficial. And I wasn't even hitting onto what the real moment was. This, this experience caused me to actually reflect and figure out what that moment was. Because that moment, I wanted to shove under a rug. I was embarrassed by it. I thought it would define me in a way that wasn't powerful, that it was weak. The reality was that was my defining moment. That made me who I am today. It set me on a path and gave me a contract that I had no idea. And here I am at this Defining Moments event, speaking to thousands of women who were entrepreneurs giving grants to follow their dreams, giving this speech, and I finally realized I, that moment set me on a path that set me up to be who I am, what I do for a living. I speak about entrepreneurship, happiness, and economic independence. Those are the three things I talk about all day, every day. Entrepreneurship to me is a journey of self-transformation. Each one of you in here is an entrepreneur. You don't have to own your own business, but you have to control your own life and fate. Entrepreneurship is a journey of self-transformation. I say that because it's a moment where you have to look at yourself in the mirror every day and be truthful and honest of who you are, what your weaknesses are, and what your strengths are, and own those truths. Be honest about those truths. And surround yourself by the people who make up for your weaknesses. My business partner is the opposite of me. He would die standing up here. He would never want to go on television, ever in a million years, and he would never want to be in a pitch meeting. All three of my favorite things to do professionally. <laughs> he enjoys sitting behind the computer, doing research, and figuring out how operations work. All the things that I don't want to do ever on a day-to-day -day basis. But why I share that story with you is that you can understand when I tell that story and, and you see me standing here today, how that trigger moment truly does help to find. That formula that once I had created, why I did the PBS special, has never failed. When someone is living their passion and purpose on course and fulfilled, I always can tell what their childhood was almost instantly. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. And so that is a massive key to start to unlock why you're here, what your purpose is. That allows you to tap into your passion. Passion is your fuel, unlimited fuel. 
It's something that allows you to not have to sleep so much. It's something that allows you to recover from crazy days quickly. It's something that allows you to have massive, abundant energy that people want to be around you constantly. But you have to do the work. You have to be honest with who you are. As I go on my journey, every single day, every obstacle I come up against, I think to myself, what am I supposed to be learning here? I don't say, man, not me, why me, why does this always happen to me? I stop and say, <clears throat> what is my lesson? And if you look at every obstacle as an opportunity to learn and grow, you are now empowered. If you see everything that ever happened to you in your life as an opportunity to learn about yourself and grow and become strong, then you are powerful and empowered and therefore can empower other people. I'm going to share with you habits of empowered leaders that are easily incorporated into your life. And being that this is a, women, a woman's event, I'm going to give you a little bit more backstory on that, this topic as well. Arianna Huffington recently said that there's a next feminist movement happening right now. I agree with that. But I believe it is in a very different way this time. The first feminist movement, the second feminist movement as well, were really about gender being divided, one being better than another, one not getting as much as the other one gets. I believe now we're in a stage that we've recognized as women our strengths, and we're starting to own them in a very different way. I believe that this movement is about women and men coming together holistically, owning their feminine energy or their masculine energy, owning their characteristics that are feminine and being proud of them because it's what makes us unique, and men owning theirs. Most of my business partners are men. Why? Because they provide an energy that I don't have for certain things that I need to holistically be more successful. And so in this movement, I believe if we as women can own our strengths and not try to become like the guys in our space, but actually look to their uniquenesses and own our uniquenesses, we will complement each other to create a greater whole and create a greater impact and create unity instead of division. And that is what's powerful. I was at the Women's Leadership Summit in New York last week. There were 60 speakers, over 10,000 people. It was UN week, so there was a lot of UN ambassadors speaking from very different perspectives all over the world, and it was amazing. I was one of the first speakers. I was the second speaker, as a matter of fact. And when I said that statement in a keynote, it kicked off something that I didn't expect, but I was really excited to see. A lot of people didn't expect me to say that at all. Um, a lot of people in the room were also men. And what it did is created that united vibe for the rest of the day instead of the separation, which was really a powerful thing. But in this, this journey that I'm going to take you on right now with these habits, these habits are masculine and feminine, or I should say dominantly feminine. M but masculine men can also own these things. It's a lot more challenging for them. So if it's more challenging for them, we are their teachers. They've taught us a lot of things about operations and things like that in business that are more masculine driven. We now have a lot to teach. But we have to embrace it and not play by the old rules. Not play by what was done before, but play by what should be done now in order to create united fronts, in order to create a holistic impact that is greater. Because that's the only way change happens. If we keep repeating the same mistakes, we keep getting the same results. It's proven. So the only way that we can evolve and change is recognize our own evolution. Women have evolved a lot quickly. To the point where a lot of my guy friends and colleagues say, I don't even know what to do anymore. I don't even know how to handle the evolution. And it's not being mean. What our job is to teach them. We speak a different language, just as they do, to us. But if we can actually teach and communicate, then we become more effective together. The first habit of empowered people is to become more mindful. Mindfulness is the foundation. Everything else I'm about to say after this makes no sense at all if you are not mindful. Mindful of every single thought that you think. If you think negative thoughts, you will get negative results. If you think negative in a victim way, you will become a victim and stay a victim. 
If you think I can't, you won't. If you think I will, then you will. I know in the word, um, or the book, The Secret, is talked a lot of for the last almost decade. Bob Proctor, the man who actually taught the woman who wrote that book, was my personal mentor over 13 years ago. It is not theory that's thrown out to, to, buy, to sell a book. It's quantum physics. It's quantum physics, proven, all in theory. It's the law of attraction. They're all laws in, of physics. Your thoughts are energy. That energy is a frequency. You can have a low frequency, which is negative thoughts, or you can have a high frequency, which are positive thoughts. If you're thinking low, you're attracting low. You're attracting people, circumstances, and lacking opportunities. You're thinking scarcity. If you're thinking abundance, positive, you are attracting abundant people with good energy, doing really good things. Which way do you think you're more successful? The high frequency thoughts. I want you to start thinking about that from this day forward. Am I in a high frequency or am I in a low frequency? You'll know by your energy. The second I do like a scan, it's almost like doing a body scan. Where am I at? What's my frequency? I won't walk into a meeting if my frequency is not high. What's the point? If I can't get it high, I start skipping. Kid you not. Skipping. Do you ever watch kids skip? It actually like ignites like excitement and energy and your energy's up or I crank the tunes in my car. You have to have your energy up in order to attract the things that you want. Every thought that you think, every word that you speak. So you think and then you put your words. That's even more powerful energy. So if you say to your team, I hope that we can do this or we will do this, how do you think people are following you? I will. Because if you tell me, I hope, I'm not going with you. I'm not getting on that lifeboat with you. I'll go on my own. Your words are powerful. It defines how people follow you. It defines whether people surround themselves with you or not. Words are subconscious. A lot of times people don't even know what they're hearing or feeling, but they're not liking it. How many of you have ever been near somebody? They barely even said a word and you're just like, oh, I just don't want to be around them. I don't even know why. It's because their energy was at a low frequency. Even if they put on the greatest, most charismatic smile and handshake, their frequency is low. That's why you didn't want to be around them. So think about that. Where am I at? Do people want to come to me and be attracted to me? Or are they repelled from me? Sometimes they might be. Those are things that are all in your control and it starts with your thoughts. Your thoughts, your words, the people you surround yourself with. Mindful of the people you surround yourself with. I live in the drama-free zone. Literally the drama-free zone. I refuse to allow any drama into my space. I'm very clear at articulating that to people. When I hear people gossiping, when I hear people complaining, when I hear people being negative, I say your drama is now in my zone and you need to step away from my zone. <laughs> because this is the drama-free space. Once you say that to people, no one calls you complaining. They might call you with issues so that you can work through them. No one calls you complaining, no one calls you gossiping, and no one brings their stuff into your space. My daughters, I have nine-year-old twin daughters, and children learn everything. They hear everything, they see everything. You are their model. Last summer, I locked myself out. I had my, a key, like just, I took the little key, put it in my wallet, because I didn't want to have my whole keychain. And I locked, I thought I locked ourselves out. And I said, oh, no, I can't find the key. And my one daughter, Morgan, goes, oh, great. We are going to be locked out all night. And Madison looks at her and she goes, could you please keep your negative thoughts out of my space? <laughs> and I look at her. I go, high five, girlfriend. Where did you learn that from? She goes, you, you say stuff like that all the time. I don't understand it half the time, but that sounded appropriate. <laughs> and I was like, that was so appropriate. That was amazing. All those years of what I was articulating, but living, she got it. I am so proud she got it because now that they're nine, I see things starting to happen in school. Things that I know that might have been more challenging for them to handle had they not learned about the drama-free zone their entire childhood. The first week of school, they came home with an issue. I said, how did you handle it? They said, well, we live in the drama-free zone. And if you want to have drama, you got to keep it out of our space. Powerful for a nine-year-old to set that tone at fourth grade for the rest of her school career, I, I hope. 
But you need to empower yourself by setting boundaries. If you're hanging out with drainers, you will be drained. Detox the drainers in your life. Increase the enhancers. If you're spending time with drainers, then you will be drained. If you're spending time with drainers, then you will be exhausted and have no space for the people who fill you up, who inspire you. I have my power posse. My power posse knows that they're my power posse. And if I'm in a funk, I can't get my own mental reset going, I call them immediately and instantly I'm back on, on my page that I want to be on. You need your power posse, lifting each other up constantly, knowing that you all have the same integrity, knowing that you all have the same intention to be the best version of yourself every day, and knowing that their intention is to lift you up and inspire you every day. I go through my Facebook feed. By the way, talk about drainers. If you have t toxicity in your Facebook feed and you're looking at it first thing in the morning, guess what happens? Your energy goes like this. When I wake up in the morning, I look at my Facebook feed, I get so inspired. It might be 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm laying in my bed scrolling through, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, three of my friends, I think, wrote like five books already. They were on the Today Show, and one's like launching a rocket soon. They're so invigorated and so excited that it inspires me, and I feel like at 7 a.m. I didn't do anything, and I need to do like a million things. It inspires me. One day my girlfriend borrowed my computer, forgot to log out of her Facebook feed, so I turned it on, not realizing that she used Facebook and forgot to log out. And I'm scrolling through. I'm like, what is this? Who are these people? Why is everything so negative today? So I realized that it was her feed. And I said to her, how on earth do you function after reading that all day? I'd be exhausted. I'd be drained. I'd be agitated. That just by reading that affects your energy. All these things that you don't realize, that you're not mindful of, affect you. What you watch on TV. I'm on TV. I don't watch TV. Why? Or, that's a lie. I watch Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> and I watch my daughter's children's shows on Disney, which I think are hilarious. But I don't watch TV. I don't watch the news. I don't watch negative things. I don't watch people killing each other. Why? Because I don't want that in my subconscious. I, don't, I, I, I can find the news out. I don't need to listen to it for 12 hours straight. But my friends that are in the stock market, they always have CNBC on in the background, and I go, why do you do this to yourselves? Why? why? Just because all you're hearing all day is this. It's not like you're doing anything with it. You're just torturing yourselves. And so when you listen to negative things around you, whether it's the television shows that you're choosing, it affects you. I was on the train last week going from Philly to New York. Every single one around me was, was complaining or gossiping about people. I couldn't, I, I was so upset I didn't have earphones. Like, I wanted to be like, me, 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 me. All this noise that, it was so early in the morning. I, it was like secondhand smoke. Literally like breathing in secondhand smoke for me. It was like stifling me. If you don't notice that, I want you to get at a point where when someone's negativity is like secondhand spoke to you. It's powerful. The books that you choose to read, the magazines that you read, they affect you. If you're having body image issues, probably not a good idea to go through Us Weekly and Star and In Touch and all those magazines every single week, desperate to approve your own self-sabotaging thought process. It will only feed into the negativity that you're trying to break the cycle of, your own paradigm. You probably want to look into more spiritual books. You want to probably read things about personal growth, like Yoga Journal. You probably want to find things that inspire you, like Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine. Things that are adding to your value, not taking away. Mindfulness is everything that you do. Everything affects you. If you're not aware of it and how it's affecting you, then you are going to be stuck and not be able to move forward. Keep this philosophy in your mind. Detox the drainers, increase the enhancers. Constantly evaluate, assess, reflect. That is the only way you grow. The number, one, the number two one, and I'm going to fly through these because I want to save some time at the end, but maybe five minutes on the end. Um, number two is forgiveness. Now, this is the one that I crack up because people say, well, he did this to me and she said this to me. Guess what? Everyone you're mad at doesn't even care. That's why you're mad at them, right? So you're wasting all of your energy being mad at them and they don't care. 
It's silly, right? It's crazy. Do you know how much energy is wasted in being angry at somebody? Do you know how much energy is wasted in being angry? So much. And guess where that frequency is? Down here. Like you can't even see because it's on the floor. That's where your energy frequency is when you're angry with somebody. Forgive them. Let it go. Make space for better things in your life. Be free. It's like shackles on your feet when you're angry at somebody. I forgave my father, by the way, in that story. Freeing. I understand the number three habit is compassion. I understand that he did not grow up the way that I would have liked him to grow up, that I would have wanted him to be as a father. He wasn't given the tools to be emotionally available. He wasn't given the tools to be, have any emotional capacity to think about anybody else but himself. He wasn't given love and support and nurturing as a child. He wasn't. I can give it to him as an adult and teach him as his child now because I've forgiven him and now I have compassion. And now my daughters get to see a cycle broken. My daughters get to see me teach him. So they get to lo learn what compassion is and unconditional love is. Compassion in your workspace. You have no idea what somebody's gone through. You have no idea. When I hear people gossiping, I, I get so aggravated because they're pointing out and judging things about somebody that they don't even know what somebody went through to be where they are. They don't know. If someone's not happy. My father wasn't a happy man. He wasn't happy because he wasn't raised happy. But I'm teaching him to be happy. People can learn. In every interaction when you have with a human being, you have an opportunity to hurt them or heal them. Those are your two choices. Do you want to hurt them or do you want to heal them? Healing is being kind. It's being compassionate. It's being warm and inviting, engaging, even when someone can't engage back with you. You're setting a model for somebody else. That's a powerful thing. How many people in your workspace do you see come in and they might be in a bad mood? You have no idea and they probably won't share it with you. You can maybe set a space for them to share it. Hey, I can see you're in a really bad mood today. If you want to share, I'm here. That's healing to somebody. I had a woman call me. This woman who is, I was speaking for this event, she set the flight for like me leaving at a completely different city and it was in Philadelphia. And I called her and I was like, uh, we have a little problem. I'm not, I'm not based in Chicago. And so it's not really not going to work for me to fly out of Chicago unless I'm flying from Philly to Chicago and then Chicago to you, which really doesn't make sense. And she flipped out at me, flipped. And I said to her, I'm not sure what happened in your day today, but I think it's probably best that we hang up. And you can call me whenever the, the space is cleared for you to have the conversation that's proper right now. And now is not the right time. We hung up. She called me back four hours later, hysterical crying. Her husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease the day before, and she has three small children. I knew, had I attacked back to her, it would have caused more damage in the relationship, and it would have caused more damage to me. I would have felt guilty. I would have felt bad especially had I learned that afterwards. So you have an opportunity. Once you're compassionate, you can heal people. That's powerful. Do you understand how powerful that is? Think about your workplace and all the people that you can affect and change in a positive way. Is that not leadership? Compassion is leadership. Think about Gandhi. That wasn't leadership. Mother Teresa, that wasn't leadership. That is leadership. This is the feminine leadership that no one's talked about for decades. But we have it in us the capacity to do it. The next thing is set the intention every day to inspire and empower others. If you wake up and go to work every single morning and think, who am I going to empower and inspire today? <laughs> that is a powerful thing. Now you go and it's like a game. It's like, who can I look to like rise up? Who can I look to encourage? Who can I look to be a role model for? Who can I look to make smile? Who can I look to make good about, feel good about themselves? Think about when you compliment someone. They light up. They get excited. That inspires them, even if it's little. If you set out the intention to inspire and empower every single day, your day becomes so much more fun. You become a leader because people want to follow you because you make people feel good about themselves. That's powerful. The next thing is gratitude. Gratitude about every single thing that has happened in your life. Everything. 
the bad things, because they are the things that make you most powerful, and the good things. I have a gratitude journal. I write in it every single day, every single morning, and every single night. Because when you start out with the attitude of gratitude, then you bring more things in your life to be grateful for. When you set out in your day grateful, your energy is up here. When you walk into a room and you own the room and no one knows why you own the room, but they want to be a part of what you're doing, they want to be hanging out with you, they want to be your friend, that is leadership. It's not about how you shake someone's hand and say their name three times in your head to remember it. That's not leadership. Leadership is owning a room when you walk in and people wanting to be a part of what you're doing and they don't even know why. Every single time I walk into a pitch meeting, I make sure everyone is at my energy level. Everyone. I will not pitch one thing until everyone is at my energy level. Why? They're not buying from me if they're down here. So I come in, hey, it's so nice out, it's great. I said, by the way, have any of you ever pitched to buyers? They're trained to try and scare you. They're trained to try and frighten you from ever pitching ever again. And they're trained to make you not want to sell anything to them, which is the opposite of what really should be happening from the CEO's perspective of that corporation. Anyway, when I walk in and do that, I see people looking at me like, I don't know whether we want to hate her or like her. It's kind of annoying, but she's really happy, so we'll probably, okay, we'll follow what she's saying. <laughs> but once you get them to your level, then they're going to buy from you. Every single time I walk out of a pitch meeting, my business partners are like, I have no idea what you just sold, but let's get out of here quickly. Because I'm not selling them anything. I'm selling them me. I'm not selling my products or services. I'm selling me. They want to be a part of what I'm doing. They, my handbags, my accessories, my TV show idea, that's all just a byproduct of me. That's it. The next habit is complaint-free days. My mom had a mantra that I'm continuing in my legacy, that you are not allowed to complain about something unless you do something about it. You are not allowed to complain unless you are going to back it up with a solution. What does this teach you? A solution-driven mindset. When you have a solution-driven mindset, you're an innovator. I created the Butler Bag Company, which for those of you who may or may not know, uh, was inspired by my twins when they were newborns by my frustration of a handbag being a bucket. Literally, a bucket. We could put lining in it, water, and a mop. It's a bucket. And I thought to myself, I cannot believe as far as innovation comes, that women do not complain about the fact that we have a bucket for a handbag. So six months later, I was unloading my dishwasher. I had the bird's eye view of the knives, forks, and spoons. And I thought to myself, I want my, everything in my purse standing up straight, just like the utensils are in the utensil tray. So like any sleep-deprived new mom, I took the dishwasher tray out of the dishwasher, stuck it in my handbag, got all my contents, and that was my first prototype. And it was like the skies opened up, music was playing out of this bag. I was so excited. I went on the path of not knowing anything. Once again, everything that I do, I don't know what I'm doing before I do it. That's actually how I gauge my excitement. Because if I don't know what I'm doing, I'm getting out of my comfort zone. Learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, and you will grow exponentially. So anyway, by the way, fear of failure was my biggest fear. And once I got over that, I embraced that whole philosophy to a whole different level. My mantra, when I realized fear was holding me back, my fear of failure was holding me back from my greatest success, I came up with a mantra that I have more fear of regret than I have of failure. I have more fear of regret than I have of failure. Because fear is still an instinct, it's survival. So if I can override my fear of failure with my fear of regret, then I'm going to do a lot more in my lifetime. Change my entire life. I didn't just say it once or twice, by the way. When you say an affirmation, you say it all day, every day, until it becomes who you are. Until it just becomes who you are. I don't think about that anymore. I almost forget about it because it is who I am. I have no fear in business whatsoever. I like to strive to be uncomfortable, though. But anyway, when I went on this journey to launch the Butler Bag Company, I didn't know what I was doing. Every single guy that I had int was introduced to, by the way, I say guy because it literally is all guys controlling your handbag purchases and manufacturing. And I said to them, I have this idea, and they said, women only want fashion, they don't want function. I said, well, wait, I'm a woman, and I do, and all my friends do. And so had I listened to everyone along the path, I wouldn't have gotten this company launched and 
I wouldn't probably be standing here today because that launch of the Butler Bag Company led to so many am amazing opportunities in my life. That Butler Bag Company, by the way, became one of the fastest growing handbag brands in history. Hit $1 million in the first year and $10 million in the second. For women who don't want function and only want fashion, there were a lot of people buying the function fashion handbag. <laughs> Lesson on, never listen to somebody who says, no one wants that, when you know that it's a good idea. If people want to provide change, often there's going to be resistance. I always use the example, no one was looking for Survivor when Mark Burnett was pitching it, and it changed the face of television. As a matter of fact, bless you, Mark Burnett was turned down at least six times, three by Les Moonves, who is the president of CBS, who now owns Survivor for probably about almost 15 seasons right now, 15, um, 15 years, which is like unheard of in television years. No one's looking for innovation when, when you're pitching it. Change is uncomfortable for people. Solution-driven mindsets come from the, the mindset that you're not allowed to complain. So you solve a problem instead of complaining. That's, you're still thinking about the complaint in your head, but you're driven to solve the problem. Powerful. That's a leader quality right there. The last one is something so simple, but yet so powerful. I live between Philadelphia and New York City. And when I'm in New York a lot, I have a lot of events, and they're out, and, and New York social life, uh, New York business social life is out and at nighttime. And I always crack up when I walk into like a bar, and I see really pretty girls standing there, and they're like. <laughs> and I think to myself, I think she's trying to attract somebody, but I don't know what guy in his right mind is going to walk up to that girl, because he's probably scared of her because she does not look happy or engaging. If you smile, it changes everything. It is that simple. People are attracted to happy people. People are attracted to people that are smiling. It engages people. It brings people in. If you look angry, people don't want to talk to you. If you look scared, people don't want to talk to you. If you look happy, if you're just smiling even though you don't know why, you engage people, you make conversations. That is a leader. Leaders lead because people want to be around you, because you're fun, because you're happy, and because you're engaging. And people want to be like you. Smiling changes everything, whether it's to people in your office, whether it's to random people on the street. It's, it doesn't matter. And the interesting thing is, you think you're doing it for other people, you actually wind up getting some of the greater gifts coming back to you and being kind and smiling to other people. I have a t-shirt that one of my girlfriends started this company. It's called Be Good to People. So I always wear the t-shirt. It says, Be Good to People. I can't tell you how many conversations are started by this t-shirt. From every single type of person, from every single background, this conversation starts this t-shirt starts so many conversations, I want to wear it almost every day just because I think it's hilarious. Like I said to her, I think we should do a documentary on people just wearing this t-shirt and getting people's responses from it. It's so powerful. But if you smile, you change everything. You become an effective leader just because you seem pleasant and you seem happy. Even if you're still working on your own inner happiness, it's a step to get you on that path. It's part of your own transformation. Everything happens in steps, but you have to be moving forward because if you're not moving forward, you're standing still, which means you're not growing. And when you're not growing, your soul is dying. Your passion is dying, and so is your happiness. I want to leave you with one last thought. I know that a lot of people, as they begin to grow and evolve, those people who were the drainers want to keep them where you were. And they're no, they don't like the change because they don't want to lose you as their camaraderie and their unhappiness. So with that I say, never allow someone to dim your light because they are unaware of their own darkness. However, you can shine your light so bright that you can only illuminate theirs. People can't change unless they're willing to change, but you can be a model for their change. You can allow your own light to illuminate. You have no idea how many people you're impacting and staying positive even if they seem unhappy, even if they're trying to bring you down, you're impacting them and stay strong in that space and you will be the most effective leader possible. 
I thank you all for being here tonight. I know that you didn't have to be here, as I mentioned, so I hope that I gave you enough abundance to walk away with. Have a great night. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. I went over. How, how much time do I have? Okay. I, I actually am going to be allowed to do questions still. <laughs> you guys didn't kick me out yet. <laughs> Um, so I do want to answer, I want to see who has questions. I always know that this first question, everyone gets timid and shy. So this is how I always start this question. Who is the most empowered person in here to ask the question first? Change of perspective, eh? Okay, great. <laughs> it becomes a challenge that way. Who is the most empowered? Let me think, let me think. So... Clearly, clearly, this is what you're doing now also too, um, I guess for a living as part of this inspirational speaking. So when, when did you shift from being an, on, well, I guess you still really are an entrepreneur, but you know, doing the, the bag work, et cetera, working on the exercise and moving to doing inspirational speaking? So I was doing inspirational speaking when I was a fitness competitor because it's so closely combined, but it was more about fitness and wellness. Um, psychology has always been my passion. Um, psychology of why people do what they do, psychology of success, psychology of happiness. So I was always doing part of it, but when you're in business, especially as an expert, especially um, uh, on television, you have to pick a lane, so to speak. So I kind of kept pushing lanes. So I went from the fitness lane to lifestyle lane, which was the handbags and accessories. And I still am very much immersed into that world. Um, but then I then pushed that lane a little bit further to small business entrepreneurship. And then now I'm pushed into the lane, the lane that I've always wanted to be in, the one that I started out knowing that I wanted to be in, which is how do you empower other people to empower themselves. Um, when I uh, talk about manifestation, I, and I have a million stories like this, but I'll share one. Um, four years ago, or actually five years ago now, um, when I was watching PBS, well, my daughters were watching PBS. Um, it must have been like Dora or something. And it ended. And then went into a PBS special by Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I don't know if you've ever read his books, but if you hadn't, I highly recommend them. Um, so I see Robert Kiyosaki doing a PBS special. And I'm watching it, and I thought to myself, man, I want my own PBS special someday. I have no idea what it's going to be. I don't know what I'm talking about exactly. But I want my own PBS special. And I sat with that thought. So by the way, when the, the, the trigger thing isn't about just thinking what you want. You have to believe that you can have it. If you don't believe that you're worth it, you're just putting thoughts that aren't backed up by emotion. Emotion's actually what puts fuel to your energy. So I actually sat down and envisioned myself in that moment on PBS, speaking back to me. I envisioned the entire thing. And then as fast as I thought about it, it was like a Kodak moment. Whenever I have those moments that I want to manifest, I actually, as I daydream, I snap them like a Kodak moment so that I can keep them clear in my vision and bring them back up in my memory. And I also feel emotion. So I make sure every one of those memories have emotion tied to it. It feels good. It feels exciting. It, it, it feels scary. Whatever it is, it has to have emotion. And as fast as I'm thinking, my daughters come in the room and start tearing the room up again. And so I forgot about it. I never, ever once told anyone. Never once told anyone. I forgot about it. I never pursued it, never told an agent about it. Um, I got a phone call two years ago out of nowhere from this guy. And he says, hi, I'm Richard Taylor. I'm an executive producer for PBS. And we are looking for the female Wayne Dyer meets Robert Kiyosaki, and we heard that's you. And I said, no way. Oh, my gosh. I thought of this three or four years ago. And I literally, like, exploded on the phone. I felt like I was being punked. <laughs> and I said to him, um, I, I thought of this, and I told him the whole story with Robert Kiyosaki, and he said, well, you did a great job manifesting because I am the executive producer that did Robert Kiyosaki's show. Um, this past spring is when I launched the PBS special. That PBS special, though, really became a catapult for me um, to be staying in this category and space um, without having to play in the other spaces as much. Um, you know, when people ask me about patents when they're launching a company, like I could talk about it all day long, but I'm not passionate about it. Um, so I like staying in this space because I, it's, it's what ignites fire in people and all other things are possible from that fire. 
Um, but anyway, that PBS special is such a powerful example of I didn't pursue it even, and it came to me. I wasn't working at it, but I was working on myself every day to be the person I needed to be to have that opportunity present itself. Thank you for that question. Great job, by the way. Thank you. It's very motivational and powerful. But one question I had is um, there's an article by the, from the Huffington Post that's kind of going viral in terms of Gen Y. So mm -hmm. I'm a product of Generation Y, born to be like ambitious and you know, you're raised, oh, you're so special, you can be whatever you want to be. And then what they're saying is, you know, happiness equals your reality minus your expectations. Mm -hmm. And our expectations are inflated. And our reality may not be as good as what our parents have maybe told us it would be. So how do you deal with that? Um, I also learned from Gen Y, from the Gen Y guy, that if, because I put punctuations into my text messages, it makes me not cool and defines my age. <laughs> And I was like, I just can't not comma. I have to comma. <laughs> um, that's actually an interesting topic, which is the opposite of, of what I had growing up and what a lot of um, successful people, which is where the topic came from. If you, look at, uh, the, if you look at the greatest wealth and you think of who those people are, it's um, Oprah, it's Steve Jobs, it's uh, Michael Dell, it is uh, Mark Cuban. Um, uh, Martha Stewart is another one. So if you look at all those people, they all had adversity in, in their life. And so there's, a, there's that correlation of does adversity breed success or greater success? And there was this generation that, you know, I'm raising my daughters in a way that I'm telling them that they can do everything too. Um, but at the same time, I also express to them and show them what adversity looks like in the perspective that, that they can see it in. And then I also don't give them everything. I don't give instant gratification at all. And I'd rather torture myself having a conversation in the middle of a toy store to explain why they can't have something than give them something because of that instant gratification and that comes with that, that syndrome that was discussed. Um, how I would manage that is that um, understanding the perspective I'm going to back up for one second. My dad came from a really, really poor space. So everything I had since I was six years of age, I had to work for. I had to pay for every single thing. I had to earn my Barbie dream house at six years of age. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, for the perspective of the Gen Y generation, the biggest advice I can give is all the people before you had to pay their dues. And so if you go in with the expectation of I'm not entitled to this, but I'm going to pay my dues and then shine so I earn it, then people will respect that generation a lot more. Um, my dad had this mantra, you're not entitled to anything until you earn it. And, um, and I grew up working for other people for free just to learn, just to learn from them. And then all of a sudden I own a company and I have this whole generation coming in being like, what do you mean? I mean, how much should we, we should be getting a lot more money as, a, as an intern. And I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, I've invested so much in myself to learn what I know so that I can teach you. And so it was such like a crazy thing to me. Like, wait, but what, Pete, and what? And as a business owner, I was like, wait, I've invested like all this money in myself to learn. So I'm teaching now. So I should actually get paid to teach in my mind, right? So, and in reality, quite honestly, I, I, I still believe that theory. But anyway, for anyone in Gen Y who wants to stand out, if you go in and think that I'm not entitled to anything and I'm going to work so hard to show everyone that I deserve, you will shine. That is how people will recognize you. And, and your colleagues in here that um, I could tell might be a generation or two older are shaking their head yes. <laughs> That's an awesome question, though. It's a great question. OK, so like you, I also graduated from Cutstown. And I also graduated in education. And I was a teacher. And I taught kindergarten. <laughs> And um, patients weren't your thing either? <laughs> actually, I loved it. I loved education, but I see it going in a direction. It, it's a whole other topic. But in that aspect, I just started working here. I've been here two and a half weeks. Literally just stopped my job with kindergarten because uh, it was a preschool, so I was there a full year. So I just left there three weeks ago and came here. Um, trying to find something else because I found that with education, I could not 
do what I wanted to do, even though I worked really hard and I knew that I was really good at what I did, I felt that no matter how hard I tried, I wasn't getting recognized and I couldn't get interviews and try and, and, and move up in that way. So what do you say to somebody who does think that they do really well and is trying really hard, but they're just not getting recognized and they're just not being seen by other people even though they're really trying? First of all, I want to applaud you for only being here for two and a half weeks and asking a question right now. Thank you. I, I, I really do. That takes courage. Um, secondly, that's why I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> Um, I had the biggest issue with somebody telling me that I could only grow as fast as they said I could because I knew that I did everything a thousand percent. That's why I think you're really fortunate because um, I've learned that this environment here is very um, entrepreneur minded, meaning that there's more uh, opportunity to grow and evolve at your own pace and kind of find, like carve out your own space. And that's a unique opportunity in a corporate environment. Um, and so I think that Education is a broken system, and it is a whole other conversation that we could have for hours. Um, so it's a broken model, um, and, and recognition really comes in the form of your students and your students' happiness, and not really from uh, many adults unless you're in schools that, that they pride themselves on that. Um, but you're luckily now in an environment where um, I think the biggest thing that anyone can do is letting people around you, especially your um, leaders, know that you thrive off of recognition and that you thrive from um, validation from what you're doing. I, I was raised in a household where my dad thought if he actually said I did a good job, that that would mean that I would stop doing a good job, which is like tough love. And, and so that's not how I actually thrive off of the fact when someone tells me I'm doing a good job that I'll keep doing a better job. Um, but if you can let people around you, your peers, or your, I'm sorry, your colleagues, um, some of your bosses might not know how you thrive. And if you can actually articulate to them that these are the conditions that I thrive in, if they're a compassionate leader that actually wants to motivate you, then they will actually take that into um, their own knowledge and utilize it as a way to make you grow and flourish. Don't be afraid to articulate that. It doesn't make you weak. It actually makes you strong to understand your own awareness of yourself. When you spoke about getting over your fear of failure, how the heck do you do it? <laughs> I kept saying I have more fear of regret than I have a failure. Um, a couple things. Um, one of the biggest defining moments for me was I, my daughters were newborns at the time that I realized this. And it was before I actually invented the butler bag. So that breakthrough, I believe, that awareness really did allow me to invent something, to see the opportunity that I might not have seen had I still been living in a state of fear. When you, when you have fear, you have all kinds of film in front of your eyes. You can't see the world clearly. When you get rid of fear, you can see opportunity everywhere and you then seize the opportunity. Had I not created that mantra that I did when I did, I don't know if I would have seen the dishwasher tray in the dishwasher as an opportunity. I honestly don't. <laughs> Who knew, right? So when, when you recognize that you have fear, you have to recognize where it comes from and how big it is and, and what is instilled. My fear of failure, by the way, my dad was a drill sergeant in the Marines, and the mantra in my house was failure is not an option. Not a good thing to teach a child. Failure is not an option, only makes you not do things that you're afraid that you're going to fail at. So I did things that I was naturally good at, and I never did anything that I could possibly fail at, which never allowed me to challenge myself outside of my comfort zone. So you have to understand where it comes from, and why it's there within you, and where it comes up for you. And that's a journaling process too. And once you can identify it, then you can start to challenge it. Challenge is where the growth comes in. I was just telling Mary Kate before I came in here that when um, one of my good friends was really burnt out in her career, her name was Luann Kahn. She was an investigative reporter for NBC for 20 some years. And to cut three years ago, she walks into the green room at NBC 10 uh, two days after New Year's, the day after New Year's Day. And um, I said, What are you doing here? It's a lifestyle show. She said, I'm doing a challenge for myself. I felt really burned out in my career, and I felt really fearful of so many things, and I wasn't growing anymore. And so I challenged myself to do something every day that I've never done before, every single day for 365 days. And I looked at her, and I go, you will never be the same person again. Like, who you're going to be a year from now is going to be exponentially so different. It's going to be amazing. Nine months after that, 
I walk into the tent show. Now, I don't watch it because I'm working all day, so I, I don't realize that there was a huge change. The change was that Luann Kahn was no longer an investigative reporter any longer. She was the host of the tent show. She had grown so much and started to come out of her shell and sparkle and shine, and shine in a way that people didn't see her before because she was so down in her own fears that she became the host of the show. She now has a major book coming out and a television, I mean, not a television, a movie being made about this book. So to keep that story in the back of your mind, if you want to grow, face your fears every day. Do something, even if small. There was the first day she did the polar bear plunge. The second day she was doing an entire day without makeup. Somebody in the television industry for 20 some years to do an entire day without makeup. That's like massive fear, like massive fear. <laughs> um, even it was like, you know, doing a day of like walking backwards. You know, something that just makes you look awkward and weird in public really can challenge your growth. So um, challenging yourself in those fears is the only way you get over those fears. Me launching the Butler Bag Company, not knowing at all what I was doing, that was out of my comfort zone, different than the other companies, because it required so much more inventory and overhead. There was so much more risk involved. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. Anyone else? Yeah, I had one additional question. Um, one topic that you touched on is something that I've actually been, you know, just thinking about through my career, and it's that there's almost a, sort of a a third wave of a feminist movement going on right now where, you know, instead of having gender separation, there's, um, you know, there's really, the genders are coming together to work together and be complementary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't really think we're quite there yet. You know, I don't think we're quite, you know, at the end of this. And one, a, a lot of times when I get reviews or, you know, so just suggestions from my team, a lot of the suggestions sway towards more of a male um, traits, like mm -hmm. being more aggressive, being louder, being more, you know, having more of a presence, and that's really hard for me, and I'm not sure that that's something that I want to be. Right. So how do you, you know, sort of bridge the gap um, and, and really do make your personality traits complementary instead of trying to be something that you ultimately not sure that you really want to be? One thing I didn't talk about today that I'm going to emphasize before I answer your question, your uniqueness is your power. Your uniqueness is your power. Do not let anyone else tell you that your uniqueness is less than powerful. If you know that that's not comfortable with who you are, that's off of who you are. This comes with education. It goes back to all those things that I told you about before, um, especially in compassion and educating people. So. What people think makes somebody successful versus who somebody is and it's their uniqueness, which is powerful to them, is something that has to be learned and expressed. So communication, I believe, is, needs to be at, at the pillar of what makes people successful in a corporate environment. And I think a lot of people are afraid to communicate. And I think when you're in a, a situation like that, it's, it's, there's a very respectful way to say, these are things that I'm uncomfortable with because it's not who I am. I don't believe that these characteristics are the only way that somebody can be successful. And, and we as women in this movement, our job is to educate men. And the ones that want to listen are the ones that will grow. The ones that don't, by the way, two men in here are obviously very wise already. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, said to, I say to CEOs and CMOs of large corporations all the time, how many female keynotes did you have in the past five years? Do you know 99% say none? None. None. No females. And I go, the craziest thing is that most of your employees are females and most of your customers are females. Why on earth do you not have a female? They say, I don't know. I actually never thought of it. They didn't even think of it. And when I say it to them, it's not like they won't do it, but they never even thought of it. And so I almost can't be mad at them because they didn't think of it, although it seemed glaringly obvious to me. But then I use it as an opportunity to be like, okay, well now, so next year you're having a female, right? Right? We're going to have a female next year because now you know, because it's important for your company. 
And so it's about educating in a way and, and not being afraid, like saying you're afraid of how you want to be praised. That only helps a good leader lead. A leader who doesn't want to hear that isn't a good leader. And that might make you reflect on where you are and, and what you need to do within your own space and make a lateral move and maybe you're in the wrong department. I, I don't know wh what that is for you, but you can't diminish who you are. And the good leaders around you will help you thrive because that's how they thrive. If you're successful, they're successful. And that's the only way success really happens. No good, there isn't a good leader that wants to keep their people down because as I see it, the more successful my people are, the more successful I am. And so that maybe might be something as an initiative um, for the corporation, and, and I suggest every corporation, to open that kind of communication as like a, a process. You know, even, it's like a relationship. I mean, could you imagine going into a relationship, like an intimate relationship, and not being allowed to communicate your feelings? That'd be weird. It wouldn't be successful, right? You work with these people more than you're in your intimate relationships half the time. It's powerful. Anyone else? We always end on the relationship topic. <laughs> I always say business and relationships are exactly the same. Exactly the same. And if we could function more in our relationships like we do in business and vice versa, then we'd find a happy medium. Well, I thank you all for being here tonight. And I hope you got a lot out of it. And I wish you much success. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you again to Jen. It was wonderful. Yeah. And I would probably add something here, but I don't really need to because you pretty much said everything that <laughs> we wanted you to say, but also that the Women's Network really does stand for. So we're very happy to have you. And there is more food outside. So if you're able to stay, we welcome you too, and we'll continue to chat. Thank you.